You're gonna get roasted. What about the teacher who could completely ruin the way you watch TV and movies? It might also change the way you buy lenses. I'm gonna teach you about bokeh, which is this. It's this area here, this out of focus area. These are bokeh balls, and they have qualities like shape and texture and fall off. I'm gonna to get to all that, but first I'm gonna talk about the origin of the name. You see, in 1997, a magazine called Photo Techniques published an article which introduced to the English language this term bokeh, based on Japanese words that vaguely describe blur or mental haze or a variety of other nuanced things. The author suggested that we spell it phonetically to make it a little easier for the American tongue to pronounce and provided the pronunciation guide, bo, which is easy to say, and ke, as in Kenneth. And for me personally, I have a really tough time getting that ke sound right because it's not a sound that appears at the end of any other word that I've ever been taught to know. And thus, I always end up saying bokeh, like flowers, or boka because those are just more comfortable pronunciations. Fortunately for me, the pronunciation doesn't matter at all because the photography community is not at all pedantic. They're extremely forgiving. They know that as long as someone communicates their meaning, the pronunciation of it isn't nearly as important as what they have to say. I'm just kidding. The photographic community are absolutely the most nitpicking group of people. And if you don't believe me, check the comments here to find out how many times I have incorrectly pronounced the k sound at the end of boka. Now, this American term boka is based on really two different Japanese words, regular boka, which is used to describe the overall blur, as well as boka aji, which describes the characteristics of that blur. And that's really something that at the time hadn't been discussed in detail. And it helps when you suddenly have a term and this was exciting to the photographic community because we love discovering new things that we can nitpick, not just the pronunciation of this obscure term, but also a new trait of our lenses that we could overanalyze and perhaps ridicule. First thing I wanna talk about is the shape of the bokeh. Now, in the background here, you'll see these bokeh balls look quite round, at least towards the middle, but then as you get a little further out, you can see they start to look a little football shaped, if you're an American. If you're not an American, I don't know what you would call that shape, but it's not round, right? <coughs> this makes sense if you understand that bokeh takes the shape of the opening that it's passing through. So let me get paper towel roll. <laughs> I'm gonna get a little closer to you. And if we look through this paper towel roll in the center, you'll see the shape there is quite round. But if we move over to the edge, you can see the cutout doesn't pass through the center of the cylinder, but instead the sides get clipped. And that's the same effect that's happening in your lens. The opening is essentially changing when you shift towards the sides of it. Next time you watch any movie that has a nighttime scene in the city with lights on, notice that the shape is different from the center to the edge of the frame. You can also just literally put shapes in front of your lens and that will change the shape of the aperture. Okay, it's kind of a heart. I never said I was an artist. Now look at the bokeh there and it looks like a heart, right? The light passing through here is what defines the shape of that bokeh, so it really could be anything. But you can also see that the actual structure of the lens itself is going to define what this looks like. This means that the aperture blades in your lens will also change the shape. So I'm at f1.4 now with an f1.4 lens. Uh, it's wide open. And when a lens is wide open, that means those aperture blades on the inside take a completely round shape. 
but let's shut the aperture down. Here we are at f2, f2.8, f4, f5.6, f8, f11, f16. Okay, let's go back to f4 and talk about this a little bit. If you look at those circles, they're no longer completely circular. They have just a little bit of an edge to it. And if you count the number of edges that they have, well, that's gonna correlate exactly to the number of edges in the lens's aperture. That's because, as I just demonstrated, the bokeh balls are going to take the shape of whatever aperture it's passing through. And this is an important lesson. If you want the nicest, roundest bokeh, you will be shooting with your lens wide open. And if you need more depth of field, like you wanna be shooting at f2.8, well, you're gonna be sacrificing bokeh unless you happen to change lenses to say a lens that has an f2.8 wide open. And that brings me to another concept, the difference between good bokeh and bad bokeh. There's not really any such thing in an art between right and wrong and good and bad. It's all just intention, right? What do you actually want? Except for bokeh, like there's definitely bad bokeh. And round bokeh, perfectly round bokeh is definitely good. And square or hexagonal or octagonal bokeh is definitely bad, especially because it can get distracting, but also because it doesn't really mirror anything in the natural world. So, Photographers, videographers, we all strive for that super wide open circular bokeh. There's one more thing. If you watch films, you might notice really bizarre bokeh shapes in the background, something kind of unnatural. That's because it is totally unnatural. A lot of films use anamorphic lenses and anamorphic lenses stretch an image vertically to cover a taller 35 millimeter film format and then when you watch it back, it's shrunken vertically. And that has this crazy effect on the foreground and background bokeh. And especially when you see a filmmaker pull focus in or out with an anamorphic lens, it's very distinct. So keep your eye open the next time you're watching a film, especially high-end films, for this kind of cool effect. If you look really close at bokeh balls, you can sometimes see texture in them. They might be completely smooth, or they might have weird little speckles in them. Those speckles are often caused by dust or debris on either the front or back surface of the lens. So if you do care about bokeh, make sure your lens is absolutely pristine. It's also possible that the surfaces of different lens elements aren't perfectly smooth, even when they are clean. Especially when looking through older lenses, you can see lots of texture because the lens itself isn't perfectly polished. High-end lenses will actually have specially processed elements that provide that sort of super clean bokeh texture that other lenses simply cannot. Sometimes you'll actually see those textures moving. And that could be a couple of things. It could be some sort of stabilization system in the lens that's causing that to happen, but it could also simply be heat waves rising and passing and thus manipulating the bokeh itself through the atmosphere. Now that we've talked about the shape and texture of bokeh, let's talk about the fall off of it. The fall off is the brightness of bokeh balls from the outside to the center. Sort of the standard normal ideal is kind of what you see in this lens where it's of equal brightness from the inside to the outside. This happens from the spherical aberration, this sort of very technical correction of the lens. And depending on exactly how it's handled, you could see that the bokeh balls are completely flat, or you could see that they're brighter at the edges or brighter at the center. Now, there is no right or wrong or good or bad with bokeh, but weird shapes, soap bubble bokeh, distracting textures, those can all take your audience's attention away from the main subject. And that's really something that you want to avoid. Some people think ideal bokeh is brighter in the center and gradually falls off to nothing near the edges. 
And as a result, a few manufacturers have created lenses that have special sort of circular neutral density filters built into them where they just sort of progressively block more and more light. So you can sort of achieve that bright in the center, disappearing at the edges, bokeh balls that some people desire. There's kind of a nasty side effect to that in that you get less bokeh. So maybe you get higher quality bokeh, but you actually get less of it. And it's a trade-off. These lenses are very nichey, and well, if you want them, they're available to you on a couple of different platforms. But me myself, as somebody who's tested those lenses, I decided I'd rather have all the bokeh I can. I don't think anybody ever complains about hard edge bokeh balls. In fact, I never see sort of soft edge bokeh in movies or film anyway. There are even a few lenses with swirly bokeh, like the Lomography lenses. And this is created just for cool optical effects and really nothing practical except it looks cool and kind of does what bokeh should do, which is be beautiful, but also draw your attention back to the main subject. There's one more thing I'd like to teach you about bokeh and that's that it doesn't matter nearly as much as you might think. Bokeh is one of these things that once people learn about it, they tend to hyper-focus on it for a while and they'll spend thousands more on a lens that gets slightly better bokeh. But the people who are viewing your TV show, your movie, your photographic stills, they're not likely to care unless it's really, really bad. For the most part, beautiful bokeh pleases other filmmakers, other photographers, and well, that can be okay. If you have a choice of two lenses and it's not much of a difference in price, but one has slightly better bokeh, I would definitely pick the one with better bokeh. I also point out, you really only ever see bokeh in situations like this, with bokeh balls. In any other natural scene without bright highlights in the background, it's probably never going to notice the difference between a lens with good bokeh and bad bokeh. But it's not just out of focus lights at night when you'll see it. You'll also see these sort of uh, bokeh balls in water droplets in landscape photography, especially in macro photography. There's a lot of this sort of out of focus highlights. Jewelry uh, product photography, like commercial photography, anywhere, place where there might be crystals. So it is something to think about if you're in one of those fields. In the comments down below, I'd love to hear your thoughts on bokeh. Hopefully something other than the proper pronunciation of it. Is it overrated? Do you see it in movies and TV and find it upsetting? Or are you like me? And that sometimes you completely lose track of the plot because you're so focused on the bokeh as it shifts from one scene to another that actually happens to me. Don't forget to subscribe because we have another video where we'll talk about exactly how much bokeh you should dial in. And if you want to know how to make background blur, watch our video here. Thanks a lot. Bye.